featured speakers Peter Brastow, Senior Biodiversity Specialist and Yerba Buena Island Restoration Ecologist at SF Environment Department. Peter has worked for 30 years to restore biodiversity in San Francisco and to connect San Francisco, San Franciscans to nature in the city. Following geography graduate school at UCLA, Peter worked for 10 years as a natural resources specialist for the National Park Service at the Golden Gate National Recreation Area. And in 2005, Peter founded Nature in the City, the first and only organization wholly dedicated to restoration and community stewardship of the, Fran of the Franciscan bioregion. And since 2012, Peter has worked at the San Francisco Environment Department as the Senior Biodiversity Coordinator convening an interagency working group to promote local biodiversity policies and programs, producing and implementing the Healthy Ecosystems chapter of the city's 2021 Climate Action Plan, and serving as the restoration ecologist for Yerba Buena and Treasure Islands in the San Francisco Bay. So Peter has done a lot and has a lot to share. So whenever you're ready, Peter, go ahead and start sharing your slides and the floor is yours. Okay, thanks. Great to be here, everyone. Um, great to see uh, our colleagues in the Natural Resource Division there at Reckon Park, so welcome. Uh, and I'm going to start sharing my screen. First, I'm going to make sure that my presentation is in kind of full screen mode. There we go. And let's try make sure this functions. All right, everybody see that? Looks good. And I'll just add really quickly that we will do questions um, at the end of Peter's presentation. So go ahead and um, write those down and then we can ask them at the end or you can go ahead and put them in the chat throughout and then we'll address them all at the end. But take it away, Peter. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Gabriel. Thanks, Shoba. And thanks again, everyone for um, the privilege of uh, presenting to you for over an hour today, which for me is an incredible um, privilege. Uh, well, luxury actually, because uh, typically as you, some of many of you know, at a conference and in other settings, you've got to cram everything you want to say into 10 or 15 minutes. So it really is a luxury to, to be able to spend this amount of time with you talking to you about what I do out on Yerba Buena Island. Um, and a little bit on Treasure Island, but mostly Yerba Buena Island. And you'll, I'm going to give you a big, long introduction to the islands. Um, again, particularly Yerba Buena Island here momentarily. Um, but I'll just say that I've been working um, out there since, well, I've been kind of affiliated out there since I started Nature in the City. Uh, so back in the mid 2000s and um, getting to know the natural areas out there back then. Um, and then uh, started under what we call an interdepartmental work order. So the Treasure Island Development Authority, which you'll learn about here, which manages the islands, um, they um, transfer money to our department for me to support them as an ecologist. So that's the nature of my role. And you'll see some of the players here in the presentation as we're going along. And um, yeah, I guess I'll just get started. You, you heard the that introduction of the rest of my background. So you've got some idea of where I'm coming from. Uh, in addition to all of that, I am still kind of maintain the loose role as the San Francisco Weed Management Area Lead. Uh, and uh, I've been doing that really since I resurrected the SFWMA in like 2003 or four, uh, because the, the woman who was running it from the county ag office back then uh, left to go to a, somewhere else, I think to a different county. Uh, and so, um, but very fortunate to work with our current colleagues at the County Ag Office, <clears throat> excuse me, including Cree Morgan there on the left and Phil Calhoun on the right. The gentleman in the middle, I think might be with the Navy. We're at the, we're at Bayview Hunters Point, or excuse me, at the Hunters Point shipyard in this photograph. Uh, and so uh, Cree and Phil are leading the way on, on keeping this um, Detrichia viscosa under control. It's on Navy land, so they are charged with um, paying attention to noxious weeds uh, at the county level, and the Navy is spending the resources to, to be on top of it. It's the only location uh, besides one in Contra Costa County, supposedly in North America, so it's a, it's a huge issue. You've heard about uh, it, it in this meeting, uh, and so, uh, yeah, so I continue to play that role. Basically, if just kind of forwarding communications around to all of our colleagues around the city about what's going on with weeds in the county. 
And so this is the um, kind of the constellation of players out on the islands. Um, so on the left, you can see the various city departments. Treasure Island Development Authority, as I said, is the lead agency that manages the islands, both the operations uh, as well as working with the developer represented on the right by uh, Treasure Island Development Group. Um, to to redevelop Treasure Island and Yuba Buena Island. And if for any of you have been out there, you've seen that there's a lot going on. Uh, you'll see some images here shortly. Uh, of course, uh, SF Environment there, um, which is me. And then, um, of course, PUC is out there, Public Works. And then the County Transportation Authority has been um, redoing all of the ramps, kind of the touchdowns between the Bay Bridge and Yuba Buena Island. Uh, and then down there on the bottom, you see our nonprofit colleagues. Uh, actually, technically, Habitat Potential isn't a nonprofit, but I kind of stuck their logo in there. Um, they, uh, they'll see um, a slide devoted to their work today. Uh, so that's run by a guy named Josiah Clark, who some of you know, I think. And then Rubicon Landscape Group has been a longtime um, landscape contractor with, with Tida out on the islands. You'll hear more about them. And then, of course, Ledge or Literacy for Environmental Justice they have grown all the plants for the initial um, infrastructure uh, projects on Yerba Wind Island, and you'll hear about that. And then, like I said, the developer on the right, and then CMG Landscape Architecture is the lead landscape architect for the whole development on both islands. There are actually many other landscape architecture firms and architecture firms, of course, involved, but the sort of overall lead um, is CMG. Uh, I think that's good enough for this slide, so we'll keep going. Uh, and so, again, it's really fun to talk to you about the work out on Yerba Buena Island because usually when I give a slideshow and I'm giving one on Tuesday, actually, to the California 30 by 30 webinar series, um, I'm talking about, you know, nature and biodiversity in the city in general, which, of course, is fun to talk about. But it, it's it's going to be a pleasure to dive in deeper to the, to the specifics of what we're doing on Yerba Buena Island. And I threw the nature in the city map up here just to give you that context. Uh, for the island, you can see Yuba Buena Island there in the upper right. And so the dark green on the map, as we called it, uh, it you can see some of that on Yuba Buena Island, the natural areas, the restored areas across the city, which represents a, a little bit less than 5% of the of the whole city and county. Um, and we do have some of that on Yuba Buena Island. And so this is what the future Treasure Island and Yuba Buena Island are slated to look like. This slide keeps evolving because they keep tweaking plans and, and thinking differently about how the future is going to look in terms of um, the exact um, kind of arrangement of open spaces and, and whatnot. But but this is this is essentially what it's going to look like uh, 15 years from now. Um, so Yerba Buena Island, a natural island on the right, you can see the Bay Bridge. Uh, mostly the development that's happening there is in more or less in the in the footprint of of the former uh, Navy housing that was out there. Uh, so kind of up on the upper slopes of, of Yerba Buena Island. And then Treasure Island, uh, everything you see is essentially new other than uh, the, the historic buildings on the far right, which is the south side of Treasure Island, including Building 1, the, the half, uh, half moon shaped building in the, in the southwest corner of Treasure Island. And then the inholding, in which is the um, Federal Department of Labor Jobs, Job Corps program. Uh, that is essentially an inholding of, uh, owned by the federal the federal government still, uh, which is not part of the development overall. Um, and then the current housing where people, there's nobody, the 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 people who used to live in Yerba Buena Island are no longer there, but now there are people living there anew in the new condo building near the near the Bay Bridge. Um, and then the current residents of Treasure Island are on the are on the north end of the island, which you'll see in the next slide. Um, and so they will all. Well, many of them will end up moving into new housing, and then you can see the north end of the island is all going to be wild, and, and it's actually referred to as the wilds. So huge increase in open space. Uh, they say it's the largest increase in open space in the city since Golden Gate Park. So this is Treasure Island, Yerba Buena Island, circa 2015 or maybe earlier, um, so even before the development broke ground. So you can see all the housing on the left side of the picture. Uh, so that's where the 2,000 people live now. Um, and so, as I said, uh, every, folks who live there, not everybody, it depends on when you moved in. There's a whole formula um, and there's lots of different programs. I think about 28% of the new housing is going to be affordable, um, FYI. 
and so um, yeah, so then all all that area where the current housing is now will become open space. And this is another view. Uh, also, this is pre-development actually, uh, so um, we can get a, a really good view of the of the two islands in the context of the overall bay. Of course, we have Angel Island in the background there, the largest island in San Francisco Bay. Um, Belvedere Island behind that, which is a uh, similar size to Yerba Buena Island, of course, Alcatraz. Um, and so Yerba Buena Island is um, uh, the second or third <clears throat> largest of the natural islands in the bay, like the natural hilly islands, um, bigger than Brooks Island, which is all, uh, out of the picture over kind of at Richmond and Albany there, which is part of East Bay Regional Parks. Um, uh, but similar size to Belvedere Island there next to Tiburon behind Angel Island. Uh, just just gives you a view uh, of the island. This is a much more recent photo, actually, probably from this year or last. Uh, kind of gives you a sense of the matrix of the vegetation. This is looking down into Clipper Cove, so you see Coast Live Oak and Eucalyptus and California bee plant in the foreground there, um, et cetera. So there's actually a lot of native vegetation in this in this photograph um, and plenty of weeds too, of course, which we'll get to. <laughs> Uh, and then another view looking toward downtown. So this is uh, of our Coast Live Oak woodland. Um, this is actually the northwesternmost oak on the island. Um, so this is kind of a neat location that uh, if you're ever out on the island, I'm happy to take you to. Um, and so this is all natural vegetation, you know, basically overlooking downtown, uh, kind of a mix of coastal scrub and, and Coast Live Oak woodland there on the, on the west facing side of the island. Uh, and so just wanted to say something about the environment, uh, the climate of the island. You can see in this photograph, which I this is one of the few that's not mine. Uh, I did put the, the credit there. Um, and so you can see Yerba Buena Island and Treasure Island there on kind of the right side of that photograph, not in the fog belt. Right. So this is a pretty typical um, late spring, summer uh, fog pattern, right, where the west side of the city, which has been the case over the last few days, is shrouded in fog and the east side is in the sun. Um, Angel Island gets some of that fog through the Golden Gate and then it kind of makes this the sort of left turn. Uh, and so often El Cerrito and Albany, um, North Berkeley are pretty foggy, whereas downtown San Francisco and Yerba Buena Island and Treasure Island are actually in the sun. Um, so so it's really kind of not in the main fog belt. Uh, so it, it does have a different environment, um, cons considerably different than the than the you know than the deep fog belt part of the city, the Presidio and and the west side of the city. Uh, so this is uh, an image from the habitat management plan, uh, which was actually done by CMG. Um, although Mike Wood of uh, uh, longtime Yerba Buena Island fame uh, was subcontracted to do to do the the biological work um, for this document. And so this is uh, thanks to Mike Wood's work. And uh, so this shows, um, and this is, you know, goes back a ways. This is probably, this map is probably from 2009 or something. Um, so some of this has evolved, these color representations of the habitat areas. Some has been further invaded, um, et cetera. And this is obviously at a kind of a schematic level as well, um, but it does give you a sense of the diversity of habitat types um, including oak woodland and coastal scrub, um, and also mixed oak and eucalyptus, uh, like I've shown you photographs of, um, and then lots of neat patches of valley wild wide grassland kind of all throughout the island. And then we have uh, one or two little patches of California buckeye woodland, which uh, you'll see some images of here shortly. And then this is a shot um, from, uh, from CMG, uh, uh, so thanks to them for this image, which shows uh, the, the the new parks. So within the dotted line are the development areas. Um, so everything outside the dotted line uh, is essentially to remain open space and and we're restoring those natural areas over time. Um, and then, of course, also the, the Treasure Island Road approach from the Bay Bridge uh, is getting redone actually right now. So that's also outside the dotted line. Um, but then within the dotted line, you also see those two parks at the top of the island, three parks actually. There's a dog park, Panorama Park, and Signal Point Park. Those are all open now, so you can go visit those, um, which is actually pretty amazing. The view is spectacular. 
Um, and then we have our two stormwater parks, uh, which are also beautiful. So the overwhelming majority of the plants that have been planted in these new parks were grown by literacy for environmental justice, so local native plants. Uh, Clip Clipper Cove Park there in the, the very upper left corner, um, that is still to be um, completed. So that's that's a few months off from breaking ground um, to be fully into the park that they that they are slated to, or that they're um, up obligated to create. So that gives you a sense of how things have evolved um, to now. Um, so a lot to go see already. And now I'm just going to run through a bunch of photographs of the island and kind of the natural resources of the island. Um, and uh, Gabe or uh, give me a signal if anything's going awry, but assuming everybody can still see my see my screen, I'll just keep rolling because um, I'm not looking at you all right now. I'm just looking at my images. So this looking is good. a photograph. All good. OK, thank you. So you can see Mount Tam in the background. This is kind of a cool perspective, right? So we're looking at Clipper Cove Beach. Uh, and this is taken from the east side of the island. Um, so kind of taking in the whole the whole cove, um, which, uh, you know, didn't exist as such right before Treasure Island was built. Sorry, I forgot to mention Treasure Island was created uh, in the 30s for the World's Fair and ultimately was supposed to be slated for the to be the San Francisco airport. Um, but what happened was is that the Navy um, uh, basically swapped out land to the city and gave the city land where the airport is now and took over Treasure Island, you know, when World War II started. So those three buildings, again, are the only three historic buildings that are remaining on Treasure Island. So the two big hangars and then building one on the left, behind which is a new um, a new housing tower. Um, so, and then this is this is the west side. So this is facing down. So downtown is kind of behind you, behind your left shoulder um, from this perspective. And besides the eucalyptus that you can see up on the along the roadway, um, this is mostly native vegetation that you're looking looking at. We do have a few infestations of fennel and um, French broom uh, within this landscape, but overall, uh, this is actually really pretty intact. Coastal scrub mixed um, evergreen woodland, so with coast live oak and blue elderberry and willow riparian uh, grove as well. Um, so that's the west side of the island called the, the Bay Bluffs. Uh, again, kind of a shot showing the mixed nature of the island. You can see some ivy in the foreground, of course, the eucalyptus in the background, and then the coastal live oaks. Uh, and this is before the causeway uh, was planted, so you can see all the plastic um, out there. So the causeway between the two islands was completely reconstructed, so it was torn up, de excavated down to the down to the riprap, and reconstructed for seismic stability, um, et cetera. Uh, and then this is uh, back uh, on the east side of the island. This is the hairpin turn on Northgate Road that goes down to the what we call the Great Whites or the Senior Officers Historic District. And then you keep going down and you end up at the Coast Guard base. Um, so again, this kind of mixed environment. You can see the eucalyptus and some acacia there right in the middle of the photo. Um, and there's even a redwood in this photo to the left. Uh, some blue elderberry there in the lower right. And then uh, a uh, red flowering uh, used to be called eucalyptus. I think it's Carimbia is the genus there on the right, planted uh, literally right in between the hairpin and in, inside the hairpin turn there. Um, and then this is a photograph. This is on the causeway. So Yerba Buena Island to your right, Treasure Island off of your left shoulder to your left, overlooking the New Bay Bridge, uh, new quote unquote. Um, and then you can see the the new condo tower there um, on the east side of the island. And then this is all Clarkia uguiquilata. God, it's such a hard species to say. That was part of the seed mix on the um, on the uh, causeway. Uh, okay. And then just a little ode to poison oak. We have a lot of poison oak on Yerba Buena Island, as uh, as you natural areas managers know, who work in the city and around the bay. We have poison oak everywhere. Uh, well, tons of it on Yerba Buena Island. Uh, hard to work in the remote natural areas without getting immersed in poison oak, but uh, it's a really important plant, as you know, for wildlife, um, for for food, for cover, etc. And it also has its own incredible beauty. So just a little ode to poison oak as a main big resident of Yuba Buena Island. We do have one California rare plant on the island. That's the Coast Gilia, Gilia capitata subspecies Chambosonis. Uh, so this is one of a suite of what we call the rare dune annuals, which we have out at the Presidio. 
Um, we have one of them, we have two of them out in other places in, in the Reckon Park system. So Gilia and San Francisco spine flower, but and then when you get to the Presidio, you add the San Francisco lasingia. Uh, so those grow in the dunes along with a whole bunch of other dune annual wildflowers. Um, and so we have just barely some left of, of Coast Gilia on Yerba Buena Island. We have uh, monarch butterflies do come through. I've been seeing them just occasionally. There used to be um, some some more commonly and monitored roosts on Treasure Island. Fortunately, those trees were removed um, as part of the development on Treasure Island. But we, we do occasionally see monarchs out there. This one's nectaring on Blue Dick's lily and just uh, kind of an ode to Blue Dick's lily, which is really happy out on Yerba Buena Island. Uh, unfortunately, the photo on the right now is all full of construction debris, but, uh, and we actually salvaged a whole bunch of um, bulbs of this plant along the Treasure Island Road corridor, uh, thanks to Bob Hall leading that uh, as a partnership with Yerba Buena chapter of CNPS. Um, but yeah, the Blue Dicks Lily just loves Yerba Buena Island, so if we get some good rains again this year, we'll, we'll see it coming up. Um, and, and this was, uh, I think, last year, 2023, when we had that big rain year. This is kind of on the west side of Treasure Island Road, so just a huge, huge um, patch of the Blue Dicks Lily. Um, and then we've got the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly, which ne which uh, has has its host plant, the Dutchman's pipe, there on the right. Um, we've all, I look back at my old maps. I think um, when I started working here regularly in 2015, we only have three patches of the pipe vine on the island. Um, one of which was removed for the re for the realignment of one of the roads. But there's a really pretty large patch on the east side of the island, actually underneath the eucalyptus on the Coast Guard side. This picture is taken uh, of, a, of a patch that was um, impacted as well, but the plant is still there. In fact, I just saw it again yesterday. But um, as many of you know, this butterfly uh, lays her eggs on this plant only. And here's the butterfly again, nectaring on Blue Dick's lily. So. Blue Dicks is just a massive uh, player out on New Buena Island. And this a couple times I've seen um, leopard sharks washed up on the beach. This was on the northeast um, corner of the island um, on all of the our um, bay algae and seaweed. Uh, so the California Academy of Sciences did an amazing survey uh, of the near shore environment um, all around Yerba Buena Island and a little bit on Treasure Island. Uh, and so this is a striped shore crab as a as a uh, ambassador for that report. Really cool report. Um, I think if you get on um, Tida's website, uh, you'd be able to find that. Uh, I think Peter Somerville uploaded that. And um, really, really great information about what's going on underwater near the island, um, including uh, a really strong contrast between the species composition on the east side or, the, or kind of the Yerba Buena, excuse me, the Clipper Cove side of the island versus the western side of the island that faces downtown. So really, really interesting. And also some some species that aren't, that haven't been found in other parts of the bay. Um, we've got some, of course, a few invasive species, but nothing going too crazy as it turns out. Um, so really, really cool report. If you're interested in the marine environment, I definitely recommend checking it out. Um, we have harbor seals as well hauling out on the south side of Yerba Buena Island. This is on the Coast Guard side. So this is right below, if you know the island, um, this is right below the lighthouse that's on the kind of southern tip of the island. Um, and this is just to the west down on the beach. Uh, and every time I've looked down on the beach, they've been there. They they are concentrated more, I think, in the spring. Um, and they come in all colors, shapes, and sizes. You can see, well, these colors and shapes. Um, smaller than... Uh, uh, Sea lions, of course, are our local harbor seals. Uh, and then we have both uh, alligator lizards and western fence lizards on the island, which is pretty cool. We discovered that when we did our first bio blitz a number of years ago. Uh, and this this western fence lizard is hanging out in an oak tree, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then, uh, of course, lots of bird species. Uh, Josiah Clark has done a bunch of bird surveys out there over the years. Um, not recently, um, but uh, over the course of two or three years, uh, several years ago. And so this is a black crown night heron um, that likes to hang out uh, sometimes on the docks. And we have uh, albino raccoon on Yerba Buena Island, which uh, I learned from um, somebody who used to live out there who works for animal care and control. And then they were actually seen again recently. So 
confirm that we still have albino raccoons or they're kind of like this really pale yellow color. Um, so I don't know if they're technically albinos, but they um, but they're def they definitely don't look like regular raccoons. So pretty interesting feature. Uh, and then supposedly this again also was learned during the first bio blitz. I think we just had the eighth annual. Um, the the slugs, the banana slugs that are out on the islands in the bay may be a different species that has yet to be described by science. So that's a pretty amazing fact, factoid. Um, and then just some of our plants, uh, Coast Edlea, of course, overlooking downtown on the rocky cliffs on the, again, on the west side of the island. Uh, so Treasure Island, just over your right shoulder, looking to the right. To the right. Um, and then our, uh, our coastal oak woodland, um, kind of main site up, up on top of the cliff to your left. Uh, Coast Buckway hangs on in a couple places. Um, this is out over on the east side of the island, literally like right in the drip line of the Bay Bridge. So miraculously, this this uh, patch hung on even though the Bay Bridge was rebuilt. Uh, we've got a few uh, stands of Seaside Daisy out there. Um, blows in the wind. And then one um, marsh gum plant somehow miraculously hanging out on Clipper Cove Beach, where we also have, uh, I think, three or four other um, kind of coastal strands slash salt marsh species. We have, um, uh, um, oh God, Jalmea, um, fleshy Jalmea, as well as Jalmea carnosa, as well as um, saltgrass. Um, and then we also have, uh, of course, our, our um, native Elemis is growing out in the beach as well. Um, and then I think I'm forgetting one. And then this this marsh gum plant that's been there ever as long as I've ever been coming to Yerba Buena Island, this one plant. Um, so it's been there at least 20 years right there on the beach. Um, we have, I think, six species of ferns on Yerba Buena Island. So this is the California polypody, the goldback fern. Uh, mostly shelled up. You can see in this photograph, so I thought it's kind of a cool picture. Uh, we've got sword fern, uh, which grows in the you know in the shade of the of the of north of the oaks on the north side of the island. Um, wood fern, as well. And uh, what am I forgetting? Um, forgetting a couple. Oh, we have coffee fern, which grows in the more kind of xeric um, south and southwest facing sides of the island. Um, so that's pretty cool. Not not a uh, not a music loving fern like most are. Um, so that's five. Uh, I think I might be, for, for, be forgetting one. I think we might have Lady Fern actually in a one one spot on the island. Uh, okay, and now our poster child for Yerba Buena Island, Fiesta Flower, Philistema aratum. If you're not fam familiar with this plant, it's a vine. It does not occur in San Francisco proper. Uh, it only occurs on Yerba Buena Island. Uh, so we love to talk about it and highlight it. This is out on the Western Bay Bluffs overlooking downtown. Um, and this is on the east side as well. So this is a really special plant, um, not only because Yerba Buena Island is the only place in the county where it grows, um, and this is it with poison oak, another beautiful ode to poison oak, um, but also because Yerba Buena Island is literally at the northern tip of the range. So you can see it ranges all the way down to San Diego and to Baja. This is from Calflora. Uh, I think that's a funny outlier there up in whatever that is, Butte County, somewhere up in the uh, North Valley. Um, and I actually looked at iNaturalist. There was a there was what looked to be like a legit occurrence in Lake County um, with a good photograph. So I might, might have to go check that out one of these days. But other than that, uh, there's supposedly, according to the marine flora, it occurs on Angel Island. But uh, there are no iNaturalist observations from Angel Island. And um, I was out there, you know, a couple times in the last few years and haven't seen it. So it's possible, with the exception of that, that weird Lake County outlier, that we are literally at the northern tip of the range um, of this plant. So it's a really special plant, the, the Fiesta flower. Um, and so we have uh, several native trees in the island. I'll show you a slide here shortly, but we've got uh, California buckeye, um, really the only place um, it seems left in the city where Buckeye is kind of growing in its natural environment. Um, I don't think we have any places, even in the Presidio, uh, where it's not an, a known planted location. Um, and so we really have a there's there's one on the east side of um, Fort Mason that I'm pretty sure is a natural occurrence um, growing amongst all the weeds there. Um, but so we really have a neat opportunity to restore um, a semblance of Buckeye Woodland on Yerba Buena Island. Um, great place to see Buckeyes 
um, in their natural environment. There's lots of places, but in the island environment, on the north side of Brooks Island, right off of, of Albany um, and Richmond, California, on the north side of the, uh, let's see, smaller Marin Island also, um, is full of California Buckeyes. Uh, so they really used to kind of be, you know, along the northern um, uh, slopes of of our islands and our short, our rocky shorelines around the bay, um, China Camp State Park. So this is in the middle of the Macala Stormwater Garden. So you can see all the native plants in the foreground there. Um, and there used to be three trees here. One fell down in the big 2017 um, um, rain year that we had. So we have two trees left. Uh, you can see the kind of smaller one on the right there. But a uh, very, very old tree. When you walk up against the, next to that, you'll see it's it looks pre pre contact to me, pre colonial. It's a it's a huge old California buckeye. And here is here it is just getting uh, a little bit of uh, trim and cleaning out. This was several years ago. Um, you can see the inflorescences, uh, great butterfly plant as well. So these are our main native trees besides willow that we have on Native Island, but in the uplands, uh, Coastal Live Oak, California Buckeye, Blue Elderberry, and Toyon. Uh, and so speaking of Toyon, here's a great photograph uh, around December, probably, as because it's also known as Christmas Berry. So just to introduce you to some of the team, uh, so Peter Somerville is on the left. He's kind of my main, my main man at Tida. Uh, so he and I work together every week constantly um, to uh, manage the landscapes of Yerba Buena Island. Uh, and again, I under under you know contract, so to speak, so under under departmental work order with Tida, which is what Peter works for. Um, and then we have Juan and Sergio on the right. They both work for Rubicon Landscape Group, and um, so they've been great partners, uh, really managing some of our natural areas. Um, uh, again, through the lens, so Rubicon is a longtime landscape contractor with Tida. Uh, and so they were not managing natural areas for many, for many, many years, but uh, they've really been um, stepping up to the plate and doing great work with us to um, learn all the native plants and learn the invasive weeds uh, and really get, um, get getting some great work done on, on a subset of our natural areas on the island. Uh, so we're, we're really working well with Rubicon and uh, enjoying that partnership. Uh, and then we have Habitat Potential. Uh, which is run by Josiah Clark. You can see there with his binoculars uh, and Cedric, who works with him over there on the left as well with his binoculars, bunch of birders. These are longtime natural resource experts. Josiah, of course, many of you know, also does a lot of work with recreation and parks. Um, and so they are out in the kind of the bigger, larger, more remote parts of the island, uh, managing the, the habitats, helping us to, to um, control for invasive weeds. All, all over the island, some different places. So we have both um, teams working out there as well as working together. Uh, and so this is a shot where everybody, we were all working together. I took this photograph, um, but we've got Habitat Potential and Rubicon Landscape. Um, and we were all collaborating on um, filling in an area out on the west side of the island, or excuse me, the east side of the island with native plants again grown by ledge. Um, in a, this was like a utility corridor where they put in a bunch of utilities. So a lot of the vegetation that the CTA or the California County, County, County Transportation Authority had planted, um, that vegetation was of course destroyed. So we filled it in with, um, with these plants that, that ledge planted. Um, and so just, you know, doing a normal erosion control treatment there and then, and then sticking the plants inside the jute. And so this is, uh. I guess after the planting, because you can see there's just a few few ribes left there that we didn't get to plant. Um, so there's Josiah on the bottom and uh, members of his team and then members of the Rubicon squad. Um, and, the, and the buildings in the background are the senior officers historic district or, or the great whites. You'll see a couple of other photographs of those um, here in a moment. And so this this is uh, just up slope from the, the previous photograph. So this is this whole area we call them the Nimitz slopes. Um, named after the Nimitz house, which was named after Admiral Nimitz, who I don't know anything about, so you'll have to look him up if you want to know anything about him. But these slopes were all planted. The The plant selection was essentially made before, without any consultation of us. Um, so these, these are the new ramps uh, on the east side. And so the CTA, um, they had their, they had their landscape, um, you know, um, architect, and they chose a palette of plants, um, and they 
they consulted with us, but they didn't really take any changes from us. So um, we, we've got a lot of that. There's a lot of players out there. There's a lot of um, kind of, um, there's quite a vegetation matrix out there. So this was all planted with California natives. Um, this guy named Barry Coates was a landscape architect. Maybe you've heard of him. I don't know. Some some well-known landscape architect, I guess. Uh, well, to their credit, a lot of the those plants, um, there was cavity bush planted out there, but not local genetics cavity bush. I don't know where the genetics were from. Um, but then a bunch of other species. So this is Point Ray Ceanothus. Um, and then uh, there was there's some, you know, uh, Salvia Clevelandii from Southern California. Um, so lots of California natives. And, you know, to their credit, they mostly did really well. They did really well because we weeded the hell out of the site over several years. Um, the way these contracts work is, um, you know, they put the plants in and then they have replacement um, costs for the plants, but there's no like short term weeding contract. So it's like, oh, we planted this here, you take it over. And guess what? If we hadn't weeded it, it would have become. The plants would have been dead in three years but so of course you all know you've got to manage for weeds when you plant something so we'll be talking about that more today uh, in this photograph you can also see a lot of vetch so unfortunately this is before we we did a vetch uh, removal uh, that particular year um so the the vetch was actually really um gnarly on this site um, but we we tried to stay on top of it but this is just before we did that in that particular year um so it's really a patchwork quilt like I said, there are many players out on Yerba Buena Island. Just in this photograph, we see the remnant coast live oak woodland there on the upper right. We see the Ceanothus and the other California natives that were planted as part of the ramps project, um, you know, around throughout these slopes. And then the slope that's below the, the new buildings was seeded with uh, basically California native species. Um, and then we planted these plants from ledge there in that swath where there was a utility corridor. And then there was yet another, you know, swiping and utility put in there on the right and that lower slope next to the road. So that had to get reseeded. So I just, I saw this photograph and I was like, wow, this really demonstrates how it's just a, a, a real chaos of many players out there. So this is what um, I'm charged with staying on top of, uh, just monitoring all this construction, monitoring all this impact and making sure that uh, we're not letting any weeds get out of control and we're, tr you know, we're doing our best to save um, what we've got out there. Um, one thing I'm really proud of, you can't really tell from this photograph, but in the lower part of the slope that we planted there on the left, we've got five osa berries, which are still surviving well. Um, osa berry is native to the island and, uh, and this site, uh, we planted it and it's doing great. Um, okay, so, um, I'm going to talk about a lot of different weed management issues um, and species, um, but the first one I'm going to focus on uh, is the kind of the first one that um, that I worked on when I came out to the island um, regularly with Tida in 2015. So this we call the Oak Woodlands Habitat Enhancement Project, um, and so I actually wrote a grant to um, Oh, NIFWF, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, NFWF. Um, and we got $40,000 to do a restoration project underneath our coastline oak woodlands in uh, here on the western tip of the island. And, and we did that because it was full of Erharta erecta. You can see it all over um, the understory here. This is actually after, I think, some regrowth. So what we ended up doing is we, we contracted with Shelter Belt, um, so Mark Heath's former company, SRAM, is on the call. Um, and um, so it was a dry year, though. Uh, um, and so when Mark and I went out there, we were like, huh, how, what are we going to do about this? And so basically what we decided to do is we just waited longer. Um, they came in with brush cutters and they just cut down all the remaining um, air heart that was out there. And then we let it sprout back up. And then... They used, they did two treatments of a quarter percent glyphosate, uh, which was really low amount. Uh, they, so experimented with that and it worked. Um, and by the way, I saw, a, I may have mentioned this in the past meetings of this meeting, but I saw a presentation down at Calypsi, I think of the one in Palm Springs a few years ago, where similarly folks were presenting on experimenting with low levels of, of glyphosate, of, of the active ingredient. Um, like quarter percent, um, half percent, one percent, you know, and then five percent, which is I think that what the label says, if I'm not mistaken. And they really didn't find a big uh, statistical difference in in um, in effect. 
So this was pretty cool. So we had that same experience. So a lot less product used, um, and and the Erharta was essentially eliminated. Um, now, as you all know, you can't just do something in the walk away. So this is, of course, what it looked like after we did that. Um, this is probably the next the next dry season. Um, so that was in the wet season, of course, that photograph that you just saw. Uh, but yeah, even in the dry season in the shade, you'd see lots of uh, Erharta normally. So um, yeah, got rid of all that Erharta. Um, and look at all the miner's lettuce coming up. This is a blue elderberry there underneath the oaks as well. Um, so thick with miner's lettuce uh, and other, um, a few other native annual forbs, uh, and then the fiesta flower. Uh, so this is out toward the, the far western end of the, of the woodland. Um, you can see a few, I think, annual grasses in between there. Those, or that could be um, the elemis. But anyway, um, beautiful patch of fiesta flower that came up there. Um, and uh, and here it is in bloom. Now, this was part of the reason that we did the work because there was Fiesta flower out there. So it, it didn't just come out of nowhere. It was there. Um, but this is a big reason why we did it um, so that we could uh, maintain and have a really robust population of the Fiesta flower out there, um, as well as uh, just, you know, keep it healthy for all of the native plants and the critters. Well, so we did all that work um, and you'll hear more about how we've been trying to stay on top of that. Um, but then in 2020, we had a massive in terms of heat out there on at that site. Um, so this is the oak woodland of which you've seen many photographs. Um, and then kind of in the far background there is that oak that I showed in one of the other photos, uh, kind of the northwestern tip of the island. These are blue elderberries in this shot. You can just see totally torched, um, really just heartbreaking. Um, I was out there three days later after the fire on the 23rd and was down in that oak down below and found a bunch of, you know, paraphernalia and like a crack pipe and stuff. So it seemed pretty sure that it was just somebody out there just being a schmuck and lighting the place up. Um, so really something, um, uh, massive fire in terms of the amount of heat, uh, and it, and so this is another shot. Um, this is, um, I think, still that that season, um, and it actually had two two sites. So this is the you're looking at the westernmost site, and you can see how far down the slope it went, which to me was really weird. If it started in that oak, which is right there, um, in the middle of the photograph, how did it? You know, the the wind the wind must have been cruising around, or I don't know what, but the fire went way down the slopes, practically to the water. Um, and then behind you, looking at this photograph, was another site so it kind of jumped there was actually two discontinuous patches of fire one really close to treasure island road um and so the oaks um were not remote were some of them were, a couple of them were torched um most of them were not most of them i think it was just the heat and the smoke that kind of killed off all the leaves this is orange day september of that year um again showing you the the blue elderberries um that are um you know small pieces of their former selves and then this is the following spring. This was out on, the, uh, I was on a boat with uh, Cal Academy colleagues um, doing the marine environment survey. And so you can see the green growth um, just coming back in the first the first year uh, there on the, that's the very northwestern tip of the island. Um, so really, like I said, it practically went all the way down to the water. Look at that, it basically went to the top of the cliffs. Um, right here in that northwestern tip. So just really bizarre. That's all just coastal scrub. I mean, flammable, of course, but not typically um, a place where you're going to have a, a lightning fire, although we had that crazy lightning year. Um, and then this is probably the following season. So this, you can see the um, some blackberry coming up and a few other sprigs of native plants um, starting to come up. Some bee plant down there on the right. Um, and then the oak starting to re-sprout there behind. Uh, and sure enough, though, the blue elderberries did come back. <laughs> they, in fact, they came back the very first season. They started re-sprouting um, even before the winter, which was really amazing. But then we weren't getting any rain uh, and because that was 2020, 2021 season. Yeah, so it wasn't a big rain year. And so they kind of withered down. But then we have had two big rain years, as you know. And thank God, uh, the blue elderberries very much alive underground. So they've re-sprouted. Um, 
blueberries are all over the state, so clearly they have a adaptation to fire. Uh, I was worried about some of the other species out there that are not necessarily in like our chaparral um, districts, but um, but a lot of the vegetation is coming back. Uh, you can see how bare the ground is still. Um, this was, I think, uh, two years ago. Um, and then this was, this might have been year two. So this, we're in 2024, so it was in 2020. So this, I think, meant this might have been 2021 or 2022. So this was all torched right here. And this is the native Elemis uh, that all came back, uh, just re-sprouted. You can see the miner's lettuce in there as well. You can see the, the oaks, you know, new leaves on. So all these oaks were basically smoked out, burned out. Um, but but still very much alive even even within the within the treetops, um, and so this is uh, a group from SF Environment. Actually, I think this is the Toxics team. Um, brought them out there. We did a weeding day, then I gave them a little tour of uh, of the oak woodland. And so this was again. This is two years hence. I think this was in 2022. You can see all the native vegetation, the cucumber and the bee plant um, all over the site, and you can see still a couple of bare areas. So this is right where the heart of the fire was. Um, but but the vegetation's coming back. Uh, and thanks to the Yerba Buena chapter of CMPS, <laughs> we uh, we had a we had a a break because we didn't have habitat potential on contract for a year or so. Um, so we were not getting enough weeding out there done as I wanted to. So I recruited the Yerba Buena chapter to come out and help me, and that was great. And so we went crazy on particularly Australian fireweed and burnweed. Um, uh, or burnweed, fireweed, burnweed. Um, so that's um, used to be uh, Eric Tides. Now I think it's um, uh, I forget the uh, Senecio. I think is the genus. Um, so this is yeah, Australian fireweed has just been going crazy out there. Fireweed, I guess. Um, it, it just loved being out there after the fire. It's still coming up, um, and so we've just been trying to stay on top of it. But yeah, really the most prolific uh, weed. Besides the Arharta, of course, which we, you know, tried to take care of mostly with the, with the initial project. Like I said, um, really the most prolific weed out there in the in the oak woodlands. Uh, I'm just gonna do a little time check on myself here. Oh God, okay. Um, keep things moving. And yeah, so, so thanks again to the CNPS chapter for all that hard work. And there we are uh, in the underneath the oak woodlands with miners lettuce and everybody. And on the left, oh, that's just oak foliage, yep. But the weeds keep coming. So um, you can see this is a wild oat. Uh, largely wild oat is what came up in profusion. Tons of our native morning glory. You can see yellow bush lupin. Uh, we had a couple of sages come up from seed. Also a plant with a little pink flower. I should give a photograph of it called, um, oh, what is it called? Oh, wire, mat no, not mattress, uh, something wireweed, wireweed rod wire lettuce, I think it's called. Um, I forget the genus, um, but look at a broad wire lettuce, little pink flower, um, Steph, Stephanomeria maybe. Um, so yeah, we actually had some cool things come up after the fire, uh, and um, and so in general, we you know still need to stay on top of these these annual grasses because they're going crazy. All right, so weeds. Um, I have I've created a flora for Yerba Buena Island, which uh, again very much um, have Mike Wood to credit for creating the the San Francisco uh, floral checklist for the natural areas of the city that has both native and non-native species on it. So using that as a, um, you know, as a background and also his floor of Yuba Buena Island that he, he did it for the Navy back in the 90s and then again with CMG in 2010 and 11. Um, so, we have a flora and then as a separate tab, I just have a priority weed list. And so on that, we have 50 priority weeds. You can just see the A's and B's here. Um, and then here are some that stand out for me as kind of our common priority weeds on Yerba Buena Island. Um, so I already mentioned Australian fireweed uh, in a previous photograph, but then you'll hear about some of these as we're going forward. Some of our favorites, yellow oxalis, Himalayan blackberry, Bermuda grass, ivy, of course, ice plant, ciabatta grass, French broom, and fennel. Um, so this is, yeah, these are these are what we spend the bulk of our time on, uh, I would say. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of the specifics as we're going forward here. So French broom, um, this is actually, yeah, on the Coast Guard side. Um, and so the seals are just down below to your right. Um, 
below this photograph. Uh, but this just shows you that we've got plenty of French broom all over the island. That's the lighthouse that I mentioned before. Uh, and then this is a site overlooking the ramps. The, let's see, the eastbound, yeah, eastbound ramps. So eastbound on and off ramps. Uh, those were constructed more recently than the westbound on and off ramps uh, that I was talking about where the CTA planted the California natives. Well, at this site, um, what's interesting here is this slope just above these new ramps. So you can see all that French broom there um, below the eucalyptus. Um, it just looks like a big thicket of weeds, which it, a lot of it is. Um, and, but actually habitat potential was out there recently and they nailed this whole site in the French broom. Uh, they kind of, we kind of waited until the end of nesting season, make sure we weren't disturbing any nests. So around mid August, they got out there and really took down, um, a huge bulk of this French broom. You'll have to trust me because I didn't, the photograph that I took from, from around this site wasn't very compelling. So it wasn't a great before and after, but just trust me, they got out there and they, they nailed that French broom and we got piles of it all up there, which is really amazing because, um, that's a lot of seed that will not will not seed again. And this is actually the reason why we're working up there. Um, you couldn't see it in that other photo, but but uh, we do have some really great uh, native plants up there. This is the California polypody, so it's kind of a polypody slope. You can see the the truck there in the lower right, just about to go in uh, into the tunnel. Um, and uh, we've also got a nice stand of um, uh, hillside pea. I uh, feel the natives, natives in there. And then just above this, we have, we have the, the the biggest stand of the pipe vine uh, on the island, the Dutchman's pipe, uh, as well as a fiesta flower uh, patch as well. So the fiesta flower is all over the place, all over the island, which is amazing, considering that it's nowhere in the city proper. Uh, and since it's a vine, it actually handles the weeds fine, just comes right up through them. Uh, we have scotch broom. Uh, this is on the Coast Guard side, I guess kind of on the edge, still in the, sort of in the drip line of the eucalyptus. Um, which I guess is why it's able to persist there because it's kind of on this, it's on the south side of the island. Um, and Cape Ivy. So many of you are familiar with Cape Ivy. Of course, we've got tons of it on the west side of the city, at Presidio and Golden Gate Park, like, you know, many other sites. Um, I won't name any other sites because maybe some of you have eliminated, maybe the Rec and Park staff has eliminated it from some of the sites. I don't know. Um, but this has been a scourge of the GGNRA, right, for many years. A lot of money put toward working on this plant back in the 2000s. Um, well, miraculously, we've only got one population, one stand of Cape Ivy on Yerba Buena Island. Thank goodness. Um, it's on the west side of the island. It's on the edge of eucalyptus. So I think it does benefit from shade and whatever amount of fog drip, you know, it gets when we do have foggy days out there. Um, so this is literally the northwest, no, excuse me, the southwest corner of the Macala Stormwater Garden, uh, where there was an oak that went down and we basically left the trunk. And so this is against that trunk there, Cape Ivy Delaria Autorata. Only one uh, population on Yerba Buena Island, thank goodness. Yellow Oxalis, our favorite, Jake Sig's favorite. Um, everybody hears about Yellow Oxalis. This is the Coast Guard base looking down. So this is not a site that we manage, um, but I saw this view and I was like, I got to get a photograph of that. That's something that we need. To, someone needs to deal with at some point. Um, so yellow oxalis, uh, we have plenty of it all over the island. Um, there are places where we don't have it and there are places where we have it in you know smaller amounts. So we do manage it um, and we're doing our best. Um, we've been we have not been using herbicide on it. We've been experimenting with torching, with flaming, uh, with propane torch, and with um, uh, uh, steam, right? So hot steam. Uh, and so both of those uh, do the trick. I've been using a propane torch in my own house on Oxalis here in San Anselmo. Um, unfortunately, now San Anselmo has a ban on <laughs> volatile fuel landscape equipment. So technically, I can't do that anymore. Um, but on the islands, uh, I think we're um, we can still do that if we get a waiver, if I'm not mistaken. Um, even though city departments are also not supposed to use um, gas powered or, or volatile fuel powered landscape equipment. Um, so we'll see how that goes going forward. But we do have the steamer as well. Uh, the problem with the steamer is um, it 
uh, you can't bring it to all the sites. It, 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 it come, you know, it's off the truck, so it's got to be near the road, the site that you're working on. Um, so we're doing an experiment um, at one place where we're side by side comparing the steaming with the flaming um, to see which uh, which works better. It, it, um, Rubicon reports it seems on um, anecdotally that the steaming may work better. Um, and if you think about that, when you use the flame, it's just getting the vegetation above ground. So it's a burn down, right? Like some herbicides are burn downs. Whereas the steam seems, you know, goes down into the plant, right? Because it's water and the, the plant um, kind of takes it down into its roots. So it seems to make sense that the steaming would work better than than the flaming. Um, but we are we are looking at that. Uh, and of course, hand pulling as well. So this is my handiwork. This is up on the top of the island uh, at the park that's called Panorama Park. This is an existing oak wood, little oak grove. So you can see the oak leaves there on both sides um, that was saved as part of the, so you can see the, the new pathway with the rails going up to the park. Um, there's a little kind of grassy meadow thing there beyond that. Um, but behind, if you're facing this way, behind me is, uh, is a beautiful vista point um, that's all um, kind of redone and replanted. But um, within that matrix, this little oak grove was saved. So along with the oaks and some natives, there's some weeds, including yellow oxalis. And so one day I was out there um, just checking out the scene, surveying for um, reporting back to Rubicon about what our priorities should be. And I found this patch and it was, you know, it was just small enough where I could spend 10 minutes get in there and um, the soil is pretty loose and you can see the I got mostly all the roots. So I still think hand pulling is worth doing uh, in certain situations. Uh, and so depending on the situation, this is uh, this is actually underneath our kind of mother buckeye, uh, which is just to the right. I think you can see the branches hanging down there in the in the right side, the upper right side of the photo there. Um, so this looks like it's a weedy mess here, but uh, except for right in front of you, all around there was planted with all the plants that Ledge planted. So really beautiful landscape now, but we do have a legacy of yellow oxalis at the at the Buckeye site around which the whole stormwater garden was designed. So um, the Buckeye site was preserved, which also meant that the, the oxalis is still there. So it's small enough that one could hand pull it. Um, we could just, can, we, we also have been doing torching here. So, um, but something we have to stay on top of because if we don't do any, if we do nothing, that it'll just keep proliferating, as you all know. So yellow oxalis are you know most aggressive weed uh, at the ground level there um, in the city. Okay, so this was a new plant that I knew nothing about until I came out to the Yerba Buena Island, Canary Island Marguerite. Um, it's got a really long uh, genus and species name. You can look that up, Canary Island Marguerite. Um, this plant really thrives on the steep rocky bluffs and, and cliffs all around the island. <clears throat> um, so you can see that's where this one is uh, with some polypody fern surrounding it. Um, and so basically it, it's on the steepest cliffs. And so what we end up doing is taking care of it um, kind of up to that very steep edge. So it, it will it will migrate throughout. It's you know it's it's blown by the wind. It's a it's an asteraceae, right? So it's really prolific and really weedy out there. Um, and it will come up pretty much anywhere. I don't know if it comes up in the sunniest, hottest places, but um, but certainly uh, anywhere with some soil and and a little bit of moisture, it's been coming up. So we manage it really aggressively so that we keep it from from being anywhere above that that really steep. Um, environment. So here's a photograph of it uh, in bloom. You can see it all along those rocky cliffs. Uh, and so, you know, one of these days I really want to get to this and get it done. But we've got so much to do out here that I've just decided that it's, we just can't prioritize um, spending the amount of energy it would take to, to, you know, get it off these cliffs and then keep it off these cliffs. And so, like I said, we manage it you know, all around the island so that we're, you know, managing like, let's say 95% of the land area um, and just keeping it restricted to these these really steep rocky cliffs. Um, this is the this is the far, uh, let's see, east end of Clipper Cove um, and with the eucalyptus above. So this is pretty much what it's relegated to is, is these, uh, these rocky cliffs, Canary Island Marguerite. 
Sticky Eupatorium, uh, really invasive plant um, that I believe uh, back in the, I think it was the 2000s or the 2010s, maybe the GGNRA was spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on this sucker. Um, it it likes moisture sites, so like the the draws and the marine headlands. Uh, really loves those draws. So like places where you see the 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 native vetch, which is a little bit of a kind of a music loving vetch, that's where these eupatoriums really thrive um, in the kind of moist draws and the rune headlands. And then um, we've got it on Yerba Buena Island. I think similarly, I found one growing along the Doyle Drive corridor, right in the Presidio. So here we are. Uh, a roadway, major, major highway roadway going right through the island. So whether it blew in the wind um, from your from Marin Headlands or from from the city, or just you know the seed was being carried by by all the traffic over the Bay Bridge, and uh, and it blew down onto the island from there. But uh, but it's here, and we have a lot of work to do. Um, it is manageable but uh, it's taking a lot of management. So you can see these, these thickets of it um, here in this draw right above Clipper Cove. Uh, so downhill from this, there's a big willow grove. Uh, so this is kind of a, kind of a, a draw um, topography right here. Uh, so on the right, that's uh, not in bloom, on the left, um, kind of in seed. Um, and so Habitat Potential has started prioritizing, working on this big massive patch. Um, Interestingly, last year, I think it was last year, um, yeah, it was 2023, all that rain, the native vines completely swamped this whole entire stand. So the pea, the native blackberry, the cucumber, to a point where I, like, I walked up the, the, the little social trail that's there, and I didn't see anything. And I was like, oh, my God. Um, but inevitably, the um, this is a perennial plant, right? So inevitably, those vines, um, they die back, right? In the summer and so it's still there but it, it seemed like that was going to work um but didn't quite so yeah so sticky eupatorium <clears throat> really really invasive spreads by seed um it's coming up uh in various places around the island but especially this north facing side um draw above clipper cove and uh definitely arrived um via the wind whether it was from the bay bridge or across the bay um okay so Y'all heard of the concept of early detection, rapid response. Um, well, this species is a great example of that for us on Yuba Buena Island. This is Johnson grass. Uh, I forget the genus and species again, you can look that up. Um, but I wasn't super familiar with this species either before working out there. Um, this is actually up on the top of the island in the newly um, landscaped area. This is all uh, native plants. These are ledges native plants here planted behind the Johnson grass. Um, but uh, but it's popping up here and there again, probably um, I would think because of the um, the Bay Bridge uh, or maybe it came in with um, with erosion control material. I'm not not totally sure. Uh, and, and then I've got some other uh, EDRR species that we've got Smilo grass, which is another one I wasn't familiar with. Uh, yellow star thistle, which uh, I haven't seen it lately. I forget where it is, but I, I found it on our list when I was preparing for today. So um, we've got yellow star thistle somewhere on the island, but I'll have to relook for that. And then stinkwort, uh, Detrichia gravelon. So I, I showed you the photograph from the shipyard um, with uh, with Cree and Phil earlier um, of the Detrichia viscosa, but the Detrichia gravelons is all over the state. You go up and down I-5 and it's freaking everywhere. Well, um, it's come up on Yerba Buena Island. We discovered it a few years ago. Um, and I was out there yesterday, literally pulled, I think, a half a dozen plants from this one slope, which is the only place where we we found it, um, and little ones. So I've been totally staying on top of it. So really happy with um, with realizing that we had it and then staying on top of that species. Because literally, if we let that species go, if we weren't, if we hadn't been aware of it and we didn't know what it was, right, it would it would have just taken over this whole south facing slope on the on the Coast Guard side of the island. Um, so it's 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 currently Coast Guard property still, I think, but it, but it's being transferred to Titus. So, um, but it is on the kind of the east side of the island there um, as you go toward the the eastbound on ramp. So, um, so really important to know your weeds and to identify them early. Um, 
and get on top of them. So this Johnson grass uh, found another one a little bit further east or west of here. Um, and uh, we got on top of that one. It's coming back up again. So it's got really nasty roots. Um, but yeah, Johnson grass. Keep an eye out for that one. Oh, and here it is again. This is, uh, oh yeah, this is on the far east side of the island. Um, this is the Johnson grass, I'm pretty sure. Or is this the Smilo grass? It's one of the two. Um, I'm looking at the inflorescences. It actually looks different from, from the Johnson grass there. Yeah, looks more wispy. So this might be the Smilo grass. Um, so uh, it stands out though pretty well amongst the kind of your normal um, rip gut brome and wild oat and other annual grasses. Um, so you can kind of pick it out pretty easily. So as long as you're on top of it, um, as they come up, you can pick them out and get rid of them. But, um, and you know, your Bowie Islands are a relatively small area, right? It's about one tenth the size of the Presidio. Um, and so it's not like having natural areas all over the city, like the Natural Resource Division of Rec and Park. It's hard to get to a lot of those places sometimes. So for us, it's a little easier to stay on top of these things, um, but they still keep popping up. So we still have to remain vigilant. Okay, this is kind of an interesting story here. Um, so this to me looks like a possible hybrid blackberry. Um, look at the spines on this plant. Leaves of three, like our native blackberry, Rubus or sinus, right? You see the leaves of three on the right there, um, three leaflets, and then pretty, pretty strong spines and pretty strong canes. Um, and then here's the native blackberry. Look how small those spines are, and the and the kind of ridgier um, uh, leaflets, right? Leaves of three again, um, leaflets of three, really. And there, hints in flower here. Um, and you can see kind of that that really rough um, surface of the leaf there, whereas this is smoother, more like Himalayan. Okay, and then you look at the Himalayan. See, that's leaflets of five with the insane canes and crazy spines that will cut right through your skin. Um, so again, compare those, that leaf surface, uh, which is a little bit more oval, right? Um, and this is a little bit more, um, almost like maple leaf shape with this leaf surface. See, S smooth like the Himalayan blackberry. And look at those spines. So. Unless someone tells me this is some other species entirely, which could be the case, and I'm just not familiar with it, please enlighten me. Um, I'm finding this here and there, and it was even propagated <laughs> mistakenly and planted out. So I've paid attention to that because um, it has leaves of three like the native. Um, but uh, I've been uh, I've been managing it to a degree to make sure it doesn't take over anywhere. Um, so yeah, very clearly the native. Um, this weird looking species, I don't know, or that's a hybrid or what, and then the Himalayan blackberry. So, um, so yeah, interesting story there. Um, okay, I'm gonna focus in on Erharta. Let's see much time, how much time I got. Okay, I think I'm good. Um, Erharta erecta, which I talked about at the beginning for the Oak Woodland site. This is actually just above the Coast Guard base, um, above uh, above the mansion, like where the general used to live. Um, this is actually a little bit of snowberry, Symphora carpus, uh, in this image. So that's officially in our flora for the island, snowberry. Um, very little of it, uh, just this one patch, maybe I think one other. Yeah, I think two patches actually. Um, but air art to growing pro prolifically uh, everywhere, of course. Um, and and so the point I want to make uh, with this story is is just dealing with Erharta across all these landscapes. So Irvine Island, a matrix of natural areas, old parks, new parks, um, built up areas. This is the Great Whites or the Senior Officers Historic District. So you can see this is a, a kind of a manicured area. Um, and so this was brush cut, uh, but that's all Erharta there. And what happens when you mow Erharta and brush cut Erharta? <clears throat> Does it go away? No, right? It's not like you stay on top of your annual grasses and mow them down. You can you can destroy tons of the seed set, right, for that for that year. Well, guess what? Erharta in our maritime environment, um, uh, it especially in the Presidio, just seeding all year long practically, right? Um, and here on Yerba Buena Island, 
Um, it's a perennial, so you mow it down, it just it's there. It's not going away. Um, so I'm really trying to encourage um, our colleagues to think about this as a scourge everywhere and to manage for it everywhere as if you're in a natural area. So we've got we've got natural spaces where we've planted local native plants kind of in two different directions from this view. Um, and so we don't want to just manage it like this in the old, old sort of mow, mow and blow mode. Um, and then just you know allow that seed to be in the environment uh, to spread to our natural areas. Uh, so this is another view kind of looking the other direction. Um, so really want to stay on top of, of, of these sites and manage them really when they're near natural areas, like natural areas, if you will, right? So so mulch there, so pull out the air hard to where you can, mulch it, stay on top of it, but don't mow it and then go back and mow it again, you know, because it's just the seed will just always be there. Um, so this is what I call adjacency, right? So like I said, just to the, these are the, again, these are the senior officers quarters here to the right. Uh, there's about 10 of them, if no, maybe a few or maybe six or seven. Um, so they're kind of in like a, like a, like an L shape there um, going up the hill. Uh, and so just to the right outside of this image uh, is an area where we've planted tons of our native plants. Uh, where we've had a lot of eucalyptus come down that we're restoring into a into a natural area, um, and we're trying to keep free of Erharta. But if we if we keep that free of Erharta successfully, and yet we're letting Erharta go crazy over here around the buildings, then what what use is is managing it over there? So I'm really trying to think about how these these built up areas are adjacent to the natural areas, and then we should managing them this in the same way for these for these really invasive species like Erharta. Okay, so it occurred to me, hey, do I have some kind of a, <clears throat> a philosophy that I can impart as part of my uh, kind of my perspective on on how I try to encourage us to do land management? Um, and so this is what I came up with <laughs> these six points. Um, so definitely, I've been talking a lot about, and I, and I that was just kind of a microcosm of the first point. Um, which is to think about both islands. So yeah, Yerba Buena is the natural island, Treasure Island is the quote fake island, right? Uh, the artificial island, but let's manage the whole thing as one coherent ecosystem. So that means thinking about invasive plants and the problems that they can cause in every typology across both islands um, and using local native plants um, in our landscaping throughout both islands, not just on Yerba Buena Island. Um, so obviously we want to take care of our existing native plant areas. We want to, and we want to manage priority weeds across all these landscape typologies, as I said, um, using your herbicides judiciously and as a last resort. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and I mentioned number five and yeah, and then encourage and accept natural regeneration. So I've got a example actually on Treasure Island that uh, talks about some of these points. So here's, uh, this is a site next to the gym. That building to your left is the is the YMCA gym on Treasure Island. So again, Treasure Island where 2000 people live currently still. Uh, so there's a community out there. So we have their social services out there. Um, and so these are all plants grown by ledge, um, including from Yerba Buena Island stock, San Francisco stock, San Bruno Mountain stock, Angel Island stock. So those are really the, so it's a, it's a regional um, radius, if you will, but still pretty local, right? Um, so like the, the, the sage and the carity bush could be from Yerba Buena Island, whereas we don't naturally have Cenothus thersiflorus on Yerba Buena Island. So that's, you know, from the city, um, for example. And so we do, so it is a cool opportunity to, to think a little bit bigger in terms of our native plant palette but to still think local, right? Um, and so you can see how we've really um, uh, uh, created a native plant landscape on this, you know, in this built environment. This was all ivy, actually. I should have, I don't have a good before shot, uh, but this was all uh, um, Algerian ivy. So this is the Rubicon team. Uh, we, they tore out all the ivy and uh, we sheet mulched it and then planted it with these local natives. Um, and, and, but not only did we plant it, all this miter's lettuce, lettuce came in by itself. I have no idea where the heck that came from because this was all ivy before. Um, so I don't know, there's some seed somehow miscellaneously attached to some of the planted pots from the nursery or what, or if it 
uh, animals brought it in or it blew in or I don't know what, but uh, really cool that we had just this huge patch of miners that has come up in the middle of our of our little uh, native plant plantation. Um, so so this is thinking about those those principles of uh, manage trying to manage both islands similarly using like local native plant landscaping on both islands, letting the the natural regeneration come in and obviously managing for invasive plants. So Bermuda grass. Um, so this is that site. Uh, so it was all ivy. And then we sheet mulched it. And so this is the sheet mulch, but then with Bermuda grass coming back up. So this is one of the two cases. Um, this is important. Um, where, uh, where we are using herbicide. And so Bermuda grass, as you know, you can try to dig it out. Um, if you've got one small patch, you can dig it out and stay on top of it. But when you've got it like this, um, so we used, we used, I think, I think glyphosate, if I'm not mistaken, um, but I, that might be wrong, um, to, uh, to manage for the Bermuda grass. Um, and so you can see these various patches. Uh, so Bermuda grass, that's one case where um, we are, um, you know, again, judiciously uh, using herbicide to manage for that species. Um, and then the other is acacia seedlings or eucalyptus resprouts, acacia and eucalyptus resprouts, right? Um, so this is uh, Northgate Road. I've showed you this um, area from a few different perspectives. That's the the uh, a remnant coastal live oak woodland there. Um, that's actually um, Chasmanthe there, that bright green plant. That's pretty bad weed. So if you're not familiar with Chasmanthe, check it out. I'm sure you natural areas managers are, but um, and landscape managers, you know the plant, you've seen it around. Um, forget what the uh, what the common name is. I think Chasmanthe is the genus, um, but that's really weedy out there in the island. So we're managing for that. Um, but this whole lower slope was all acacia. Uh, and so, but since we have this really great um, remnant oak woodland with about 15 species of natives, including Fiesta flower, uh, we had Julian tree, uh, actually Rubicon subcontracted to Julian tree to come out and get rid of all the acacia. Um, so you can see them in action here. And, and so uh, after they removed all the acacia, uh, we came back and, you know, recut and then painted those um, stumps with, with uh, herbicide. So, so really, Bermuda grass and painting acacia and eucalyptus stumps are the only, are only um, places we're using herbicide now. Um, I know some of you folks would be like, you're crazy. Got to use herbicide on oxalis, and I get that. Um, and maybe we'll we'll resort to that at some point in certain cases. Um, but for now, as I said earlier, we're not we're not using it on yellow oxalis, um, just on the Bermuda grass and on the on the tree resprouts. Um, speaking of tree resprouts, <laughs> this uh, is a site just to the west of that other photograph. Um, again, look overlooking Clipper Cove and Treasure Island. Um, so the developer, the vertical developer of that area of that building called the Bristol, which is you've seen a couple of images of overlooking the Bay Bridge, kind of looking east, they removed a whole bunch of eucalyptus from this downslope area for the view. Um, they asked Tida if they could do it. And so Peter and I said, well, yeah, you can do it. Um, That'll be great for us. Uh, you're going to do the work, and we'll we'll get the benefit ultimately of ultimately being able to restore that slope. Um, well, it was a bit of a work in progress. They cut all the trees down. They didn't actually paint the stumps, so they all resprouted. So then they finally came back and they um, they cut down the resprouts. I think they might have painted some of them, but there's a lot of that re still resprouting. So again, habitat potential. Uh, under Josiah's leadership, went in there, and um, again, we waited till bird nesting season was over, um, and so just recently they went in there and started kind of creating, as as Josiah says, simplifying the site. So a lot of pre work to do before we go in and do the final cuts, maybe a month from now, of all these resprouts, and then paint them with herbicide. So get rid of a, a, the bulk of the vegetation pile it up um, and, and they did some creative things where they made a couple bridges 
with some of the eucalyptus poles over the over the little ravines on the site. Very steep, tons of poison oak, um, hard footing, so really hard place to work. Um, but you can see a re-sprout right there. So this is the beginning, uh, the st stage one basically of um, after they cut the trees and then they cut the re-sprouts finally. And now we've got tons more re-sprouts. Um, we're habitat potential is going in and simplifying the site, getting rid of a lot of the biomass, creating access with these cool little bridges so that then we can um, go in and do some final cuts and have Rubicon fall right behind and paint the um, paint those stumps. All right, uh, getting closer. All right, I'm going to go quickly to this one. So this is not Yerba Buena Island. I, I put this, I put a question into the uh, test um, uh, before realizing I didn't really have any great shots of Monterey Cypress on Yerba Buena Island. Um, but uh, what I found with Monterey Cypress is that people say, oh, it's a California native, it's great to plant. Um, but really what happens is, is it just creates an environment for Erharta, uh, which just loves that extra moisture of the fog drip that, that the tall trees collect right in the fog belt. Um, so when uh, when our colleagues said, oh, we're going to plant cypress on the causeway, I balked and said, no, no, no. But I said, no, we got to do it for the design. And so I relented. Um, but uh, especially on this is the east side, actually, especially on the west side of the causeway, um, I am concerned about um, these uh, cypress basically just creating an environment for Erharta to take hold. So. Um, so, you know, that's really important. So there, you see places all over the place where uh, weeds are just getting watered in, in addition to the fog drip uh, and Erharta is just thriving. So so why give Erharta more of a chance than than it already has by planting Monterey Cypress for, for the fog to just catch it and drip it down? Um, okay, I think I got to go a little bit more quickly through my next couple sections um, before finishing up here. So um, since it's 11 o'clock, I think right on the dot, right? Um, and so uh, this is the very top of the island. This is looking west. This is kind of, there's two parks in the top. There's Signal, um, there's Panorama Park, which is there to the west with the with the sculpture, and then Signal Point Park, which is where I'm standing to take this photograph. So you can see some, um, some planting of buckeyes and other uh, perennial um, species here. So the this is this was not designed by CMG. This was designed by Hood Landscape Architects, and so um, they gave me the opportunity to review their plant list. I did. I said A, B, C, X, Y, Z. Make these changes. Don't do this. Do this, etc. Um, so that was really great. Um, they they came back with a with a, with a much improved plant list, um, and and you know the right trees to plant. Generally speaking. Uh, and so, but you know, it's not just about what's on the plant list. It's about how you plant it and where you plant it, right? Um, so I took this photograph yesterday, actually, because I realized I didn't have this in my show. <laughs> Anybody know what these species, species is? Oh yeah, I have it here. Wax myrtle, right? So at our latitude, um, wax myrtle essentially uh, grows in seeps, um, you know, in San Francisco. If you're up in Point Reyes, yes, it grows under the Bishop Pine Forest um, uh, up there at elevation with lots of fog drip from the Bishop Pines and a little bit more rainfall than we get in San Francisco. But at our latitude, with our 22, 23 inches of average rainfall per year, um, wax myrtle does not grow on a south-facing slope like this. So the only reason it's alive here is because it's getting watered. You can see all the, the green growth um, flowing down below, below these. So this is not sustainable. This is really bad siting. Um, this is not planted by us, not planted by Rubicon. This is planted by the, by the developer. Um, and uh, they did not consult us on citing this, so that's that's why this happened. Um, and so we'll have to decide, like, are we going to keep watering these wax myrtles for the, till the end of time, um, or what? Because this is literally a southwesting facing slope, so the hottest location. If these were on the north slope, okay, maybe they'd make it without water, you know, after being established. But in this case, they're not going to make it. Um, okay, so uh, this is the plant palette that I created um, from the flora. <clears throat> So I said, hey, look, everybody, this is the plant palette that we're going to use to landscape all these parks and um, and infrastructure sites. Uh, and so that's been a really great um, relationship with CMG. As, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to go through these quickly now. 
the native plant propagation was done um, by Ledge Literacy from Rhinal Justice. That's that's Patrick Rump there in the background. This is their their old nursery that's been doubled in size down there at Candlestick State Park. Um, and so this is a this is a, a site uh, kind of at the end of the bike path there that goes out uh, to the to the to Oakland. Um, so really, to me, like let's plant native plants and then manage the sites, and then that'll help us keep the weeds out. So I think of planting native plants as a form of integrated pest management. So um, this is not the most inspiring photograph, but you can see the pot still out there um, about to be planted. Um, and then, but lo and behold, guess what happens? Uh, annual grasses come up like crazy and you've got to stay on top of those. So we're in the midst of doing that this year. This is this 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 is a planting from this year. We planted kind of late. So um, we're having to water the plants in over the dry season. Um, this is another site uh, over by the Torpedo House in the far east end of the island. Same thing, um, planted probably in February. Uh, so you can see the plants are still alive. It's kind of hard to see, but they're there. Look on the very lower left there. We've got sagebrush and, and monkey flower. Um, and again, we're, ha we're having to water these in because we planted a little bit too late um, and really stay on top of the weeds. But as these uh, shrubs grow larger, and I'm and I'm uh, lesson learned on this is in some of these sites, um, let's not plant any more like diminutive plants that need a lot of extra care. Let's plant our our, our larger aggressive shrubs and um, and spreaders, and then we can bring in the more diversity later. So that's I think that's I'm going to focus more on that this year. Um, but in the end, we're gonna we're gonna basically have a you know hopefully a a more of a closed canopy. Um, sage and monkey flower shrubland here, and so that'll help keep the weeds down. Um, but in the meantime, <laughs> during establishment, we've got lots of weeding to do. Um, okay, so I think I've got two more sequences here. Um, I'll go through really quick, 1106. Um, tell me if I need to go rapid fire, but I'll go quickly anyway. Um, so this is the Great Whites. Uh, look at that, all that chasmanthi. We're managing that like crazy. Um, and then all that yellow oxalis. So this is a, a site that we've uh, we've taken to um, transforming from from this uh, to this. So this we sheet mulch the whole thing, got rid of all that oxalis um, uh, using the the burn down method and the and the steaming. This is the Rubicon team planting the native plants again, grown by ledge. Um, and so this is uh, I think the following year, not the, the best photograph, but gives you a sense of you can see all the eucalyptus leaves now forming mulch as well. Uh, but you don't see a bunch of yellow oxalis, although it's not the right time of year anyway. Um, and then this is uh, another year later. So you can see the lizard tails in bloom. So the site's looking good. Um, and then this is looking down from another perspective. I might have taken this this year. So uh, so yeah, this site came out really nicely. Basically did this as a restoration, you know, not not so much as like a as a demo garden like that one on Treasure Island, um, but really as a as a restoration site. So staying on top of the oxalis and the arharta uh, and some of the other weeds. Um, and uh, and the the natives are really really doing well. This I think we kind of planted at the right time of year. So. Uh, we've got coffee berry patches and ribes and ceanothus and this is all coyote bush in the foreground. So everything's doing great. Um, this is just a little kind of ode to the site, beautiful um, coast buckwheat and a, and a great white there in the background um, at that site. This is another one right across the street. So we were just looking at, at a site on the other side of the road there where that, or on the other side where that truck is. This is literally just to the east, what we were just looking at. This is, this I did plant more, of, we did plant more as a demo garden. Um, so you can see kind of a weedy mess there to start uh, with a bunch of oxalis. And then you can see on the left, a little bit of the native rye grass, just a little bit there. So take note of that. Uh, but we took care of the oxalis, sheet mulched, and then stayed on top of the oxalis with, again, with steaming and torching, planted it, um, and flagged all the native plants. You can see the elements there on the left thriving and doing really well, the, the wild rye. Um, and then this is, uh, this is I think, in the first year. So really beautiful site now uh, with some spacing. But now look how filled in it's getting. Um, again, this is really a great example of, of native plant revegetation as IPM, right? Totally staying on top of the weeds. Mostly this has just been me watching it every couple of weeks and making sure um, we're on top of the weeds and I haven't been bothering Rubicon to, to get in there and deal with it because it's a really small site. So I can go in there five minutes at a time, pull a few weeds and then look how thick it is. This is this year. Um, <clears throat> but the, the wild rye is doing really well. You can see there on the left, just encroaching on the planting. So this is a little bit of a lesson. Um, probably planted it too thick, too close to the wild rye, which is doing great. 
Um, also in the foreground there in the middle is uh, is the um, Facilia distans. Um, so yeah, uh, anyway, the planting is, uh, this is just the previous photo because it just looks so good from this perspective, really thick. So um, keeping out all the weeds. Um, and then this is another site just, just south of that. Huge uke came down last year. That's Peter Somerville from Tida. Gigantic uke spread across the whole site. Um, just total devastation. Crazy total devastation across the whole slope there. But then once we got it all cleaned up, Rubicon tied it all up. We said, hey, let's lay back the top of the slope, put down some erosion control. So they did that, jute and just simple burritos. And then lo and behold, uh, not only did our two Buckeyes re-sprout, you can see there, one down by the pole and one further up, we had this weird and sympiate um, seep or wetland that just came out of nowhere. We've got seep monkey flower in there with the yellow flowers and uh, and Juncus suffusus. Um, and of course, sticky eupatorium coming up, which I was weeding like crazy from day one. So if I hadn't come in there and been weeding sticky eupatorium um, all the time in this little teeny site, this would be solid sticky eupatorium by now. But since I stayed on top of it, we've got this, this little incipient wetland uh, of native wetland plants that just came out of nowhere that wasn't there before when the uke was there. And here's another picture. You can see the juncus in bloom there and the two buckeyes thriving. And then uh, look at this, see how bare the, where the erosion control is. Now look, this is a year later. Look at all the wild rye coming back in. Um, so looking really good. So our, letting our native um, our, our native plants that are already there, let, letting them come in, that natural regeneration that I was talking about. So the wild rye is a big part of that. Um, this is the East Stormwater Garden below that, really doing its job. Um, I'm going to be rapid fire through these since I'm almost done. I knew this was going to happen. Um, and uh, so we've got two stormwater gardens, one on the west side and then where the Buckeyes are, and then this is the east side one. And big rains uh, last year. Um, so really cool to see that the stormwater garden is doing its job. This, this of course, drained after a couple of days, but after a huge rain, um, this is what it looked like. Again, all planted with local native plants from from ledge. Um, and so this is the this is the western stormwater garden or the Macala stormwater garden. That's Will on the right from from CMG, with whom I'm going to be presenting about all this next Thursday at the Yerba Buena chapter speaker series. Uh, these are some interns that we were showing around. Um, and then I'm just going to skip over this photograph uh, because I want to talk about this site to, to finish things off. Um, this is uh, on Treasure Island. This is one of our uh, seven or eight uh, demo gardens. I showed you the one by the gym. Um, we have several. This is the Life Learning Academy. So this is a public charter school still there in the middle of the island. Um, you can see solid yellow oxalis craziness. Um, and with some mushrooms there in the foreground. So this is what the site looked like to start. Uh, so we mowed it down um, and, you know, just got rid of some of the oxalis biomass, sheet mulched it. And then, uh, of course, the oxalis came back. So I was asked Juan from, from um, Rubicon this week, what did we do with that? We didn't use the herbicide, right? He said, yep, we just steamed it. So we steamed this, um, yellow oxalis, and then we planted it. And then you can see a little bit of yellow oxalis there by the sidewalk in the, in the immediate foreground. So that's a small patch that we've had to stay on top of. Um, but basically through that, through that sequence of steps, we planted it. Um, this is another photograph uh, looking the opposite direction. So this is looking toward the school. This is looking toward the huge pile of, of dirt. Um, and then, um, and then this is, I guess, maybe a, a less than a year later. Um, probably that same year, a few couple months later. Uh, and then this is looking back toward the pile of dirt, where th which they threw on some native seed. You can see the poppies and lupins coming up on the pile of dirt on the side of the road is pretty funny. But look how great our site looks with, with blooming sticky monkey flower. Uh, this, I think, is a year later. Um, staying on top of the weeds, uh, some space um, amongst, the, amongst the native plants with yarrow and, and um, seaside daisy. And now look how thick it is. This, I think I took this photograph this year. So again, uh, native plant revegetation, obviously creating habitat, creating a, a experience of nature, and just a way to keep those damn weeds down. And buckwheat in the foreground. All right, thank you.